So I watched some of your other interviews to prepare for this. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. I love your videos, by the way. The one with Al Snow. I mean, he's 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 still a good friend of mine. I, I really appreciate him. It was, you know, you do good work. So, well, we'll jump into it if you're good to go. Let's rock and roll. This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com, and today I have a special guest, undefeated MMA fighter, eight and O, former WWE superstar for a brief period of time. He was the the million dollar tough enough winner that he's going to tell us more about today. Daniel Pewter, how are you today, sir? Amazing, brother. Thanks for having me on today. It looks like you're doing great. I've done some uh, some research on you. You're doing TED Talks now, anti-bullying work. Uh, very impressive. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, you know, I own a private school district. Uh, we have three schools. We'll have six this year um in south florida and and uh i got the nonprofit. we have the branding agency um so i'm i'm super blessed i get to travel around and and build build communities and support people and you know change the world so it's it's great and the sports is what helped me get to where i'm at you know with the with the branding and and you know definitely what i did in wwe and and mma it was it's just a it's a huge blessing in my life are you a police deputy as well still I am. It was funny because one of my buddies is over and uh, I am a police deputy. So I love I love serving. I do it as a reserve program. And um, it's been unique because when I became a police deputy, uh, the first week on the job, I um, a guy stole his girlfriend's car. His wife died and his uh uh, his best friend hit him over the head with a bottle. He's bleeding profusely everywhere, and he's going to kill him with a gun in the car. So it's interesting on you know what really goes on and what law enforcement sees on a daily basis, and um, you know just there, there's a lot of you know like hurt people out there. And what I find is my my department, our, our sheriff's department, it, my my commander is. A good friend of mine over the last 10 15 years and and he, he just has a lot of empathy for people and he really cares um so he treats people really good and and you know he builds other law enforcement officers to treat people great and build his community and involved with mentoring kids and so it's a great it's a great context for me to be able to get into law enforcement that way um not every department does that but i think a lot of people are now changing the mindset definitely because of the media but it shouldn't have happened just because of media it needs to happen because those people you know i mean we're the ones with weapons on the street that are there to serve and protect and um i would rather support kids and mentor kids than arrest them so it's it's you know it's great what i'm getting to do from my nonprofit and everything else and it's also great because now i am a deputy sheriff and i get to serve the community it's a lot different than what many ex wwe stars do once their career is over. So I'm happy to see that. Uh, were you a fan of wrestling before you got into it? I did. I wasn't, uh, some of my buddies were like watching every week. Um, when I w w grew up, I didn't have a TV in my house. Um, so uh, I watched a little bit of sports um, at my friends' houses, but I, I, it wasn't like I followed a ton. Um, and so, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's great because I got a gist of different sports too. Um, I've always liked pro wrestling because of the entertainment aspect and they can really entertain versus all, every other sport. The main thing is to win, obviously, yeah. <laughs> or, or to get the most uh, points on the scoreboard. So it's, it's interesting to be able to see how an individual entertainment sport versus just an entertain, uh, a regular sport. Um, can collide together, but it can also be so much more uh, than what a, an average sport can do. Definitely when I was in WWE, you know, I can entertain, but I can also produce real results. In MMA, I'm going out there and I entertained big time. I was cutting promos, um, you know, and, and it was real because I knew what I was made from. I knew how badass I was. Um, you know, at one point I was ranked number 26 in the world for heavyweights. So 
uh, I knew I was, um, you know, tough mofo and I could also talk smack and have fun and laugh or one fight I was fighting at the Playboy Mansion, the guy, uh, I couldn't beat him up. Like I couldn't get him to actually quit. Right. So yeah. that's the goal. So I let him hit me in the face and I smiled and then I let him hit me in the face more and I smiled. So I tried to like, you know, I mean, if, if you can't break the body, the body only breaks because of the mind, the mind only breaks because of where your spirit's at. So it's interesting to be able to see who who's prepared and who's not. Now, you were into MMA before you got into pro wrestling, right? You started training in that. Uh, who were you training with when you started? Uh, when I was 17 years old, I started training at American Kickbox Academy. So Javier Mendez was the owner. Uh, Frank Shamrock uh, was my main coach. And um, it's funny because I had lunch with him probably about a year ago. Took him out to lunch in L.A. And he's a huge blessing in my life. He was a guy at the time I needed. Uh, I went to juvenile hall when I was 16, got out and uh, for fighting. And um, a couple months later, a few months later, I, I went into American Kickbox Academy. And it's just a blessing because it's something that I needed a space to get my anger out. I didn't understand about emotional or belief intelligence. And so training at AKA, the, the crazy part is I walk in and my buddy's like, hey, come train. They, they do this stuff called, uh, um, you know, jujitsu and mixed martial arts. And, and so I went in and uh, you know how they give you a free week pass like yes. in a gym? Yeah. So there's a difference between giving a free week pass at like an LA fitness or goals gym compared to an MMA gym, an MMA gym. They beat you up every day. Like they, they throw you in. And so they use me as like the, you know, practice dummy per se. Um, and at the end of the week, I'm like, I love this to my parents. And my parents were like, I was like, can I have 150 bucks a month, you know, for this? And they were like, we just paid for your lawyer kid. Like <laughs> for giving you the juvenile hall, we're not going to pay 100, 150 bucks a month to send you to learn how to beat people up better. So uh, I went back to my coaches and talked them into letting me mop the mats and clean the toilets and, you know, really, you know, earning what I wanted. I see. And at what point did you become friends with Dave Meltzer? Ah, Dave. So Frank Shamrock took me over to Dave Meltzer's house one day for, for uh, I, I believe it was fights. I don't think it was wrestling. <clears throat> and... Um, I've just built a great relationship, him and his wife, and, and he's got, uh, beautiful kids and, um, we just started spending a lot of time and, and, you know, when I was on WWE, he, he was a huge mentor. Uh, I was cutting promos every day. I mean, when everybody else was out partying and doing their stuff, I was cutting promos. I was practicing. I was training. Um, I was the only guy in tough enough to not even go home. I didn't go home the whole entire time. I stayed in Connecticut or on the road to the show. And then I went back and I would train more. So Dave uh, met him around 17, I think. And he's just been a huge blessing in my life and really mentored me and coached me to, you know, make the right decisions. Is it true? He's the one that suggested that you apply for tough enough. Yep. Yeah. It actually technically is his wife. Okay. His wife. Well, I, I mean, she brought it up to me. I don't know if he saw it. Or I think she saw the advertisement. And she was like, Hey, you got to, you got to apply for this. And I was like, say what? I didn't see this. So, um, yeah, it was, it was actually her that brought it up. So what was your reaction when they contacted you back and said you were invited to the, the tryout? So I got contacted by uh, one of their top um, recruiters who's going through all the videos. She goes, your video is one of the best videos that we've ever seen. And it's online. I can send it to you. It's pretty freaking funny. It's like two minutes long. And I'm oh, like, yeah. I'm like riding my motorcycle, I'm frolicking. Um, it, it was really funny. And uh, I cut a promo on the whole entire thing. My brother videotaped it and edited it for me. Um, but it was a good experience. And what was the experience like at the tryout? I recall it was on the beach that year. I think Bill DeMott was there and Johnny Ace. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 50 people showed up. And I was living in Northern California, so it was in Venice Beach. And I saw 50 guys. They were all jacked, obviously. You know, they're, they're all in shape. They're all ready to go. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just focused. I, I, I dropped – I haven't even – I've never released the picture. Um, but I dropped about 20 pounds in six weeks. 
And then I put blonde hair on because one of my other mentors, Ed Connors, I don't know. Do you know that name? I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar with him. He was one of the founders uh, of Gold's Gym with Mr. Gold. So he did all the franchising worldwide. Um, he built the brand and, and uh, he's an amazing guy. One of my mentors talked to him last week and he, uh, he told me, get a, you know, get a six pack, get a tan and, and bleach your hair. And I'm like, I didn't really understand, but between him and Dave, great, great uh, advice. And so I did that. I showed up and they were like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm that guy. They were like, what? And I was blonde, 20 pounds heavier, like, you know, not in shape. Right. Uh, Cause I was just about to, I was either getting, I was going into wrestling season didn't start yet. So. Um, oh, you I were like, amateur wrestling at that time still? College. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Um, so I show up and um, we did the relay. Uh, then we did the weights and then I did the cutting a promo and the promo was horrible. You, if you watch the documentary video, it's horrible. Uh, and then they said, you see the girl down there, go pick her up. So I run down to the beach. The thing, the first thing I'm thinking is like, I got to get to them before the video crew does. Because I got to beg this girl to come back with me. And she's, she like comes back into the ring and they're like, why'd you come back? And she's like, cause he's cute. So I'm guessing they're like, they're like, well, you know, he can't cut a promo yet, but he's physically in shape. Um, so let's teach him that side of it. Do you remember the boogeyman there? I seem to recall there was some issue with him lying about his age or something. Yeah, he, I think he said he was 30 when he was really 40 or something like that. <laughs> um, he, he was, he's an amazing guy. Uh, just, just like from what, what I've experienced and spending time with him, very genuine. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe he lied about his age, but at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it is what he did what he did. Yeah, they ended up signing him anyways. Uh, how did you get along with, the others that first day, did you look at them as like competitors or did you try and be friendly a little bit? I, I was friendly. Um, obviously, I was there to win. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I like building relationships and like supporting people's growth. Um, but I was really there to uh, to really kick butt and, and, and make sure I, I got number one. Is it true you were an Al Snow fan before this or is that all rumor no no no. al snow i enjoyed him before uh, i think that when i even got to know him i was even more of a fan okay so did they let you know that day that you had uh, passed to the next phase of the tough enough so i don't remember if it was a one day or two day i think it was two days down in venice it was two days because we did the same obstacle twice but it was double the length the second day when they cut some people um and then they let us know we were going to be top eight. And they said, basically, pack your bags and get ready. And they gave us all the info. And um, I think we had a, like a week or so to get ready and get out to Connecticut. Nice. And did they let you guys know that you're not getting like a million dollars flat if you win right then? Or was that like a surprise that came to you at the end? So that was in the contract. The, the okay. crazy part is they gave us a contract. It was the same conceptual agreement of what they gave us before the tough enough and, and understanding the framework. And then they gave us the same thing after, you know, I won to go into it. Um, I didn't think, I never even thought that they would cancel it after a year. I, I you know, I figured, hey, you know what, they're going to build me into something over the next you know two three years and then and then make millions and they could have um you know obviously it was their choice uh you know when they when they said after a year we're gonna you know give you give you another deal um to me that's not uh authentic in you know really supporting or building somebody if 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 i didn't win the competition i get it like if they if they're like hey you know what but for me, it was an agreement that they made. And if they want to cancel it, give me something, they can. But I, I wasn't going to take something, um, you know, that was not to what, what they agreed to. So when you initially started doing the, the competitions on, on TV, 
I think it was a while before you had your infamous thing with Curry Angle, but what was what were some of the early competitions like? So there were eight weeks. Um, one of them was uh, the big show uh, where he picked us up and he slammed us. Um, one of them was the um, Miz and I did the jousting. Uh, we did the arm wrestling. Um, so it was great to be able to see, you know, where the strength of everybody was. I think everybody was shocked. Once I did the arm wrestling, that was down to four of us. So that was like the fourth week into it. I think third, I think fourth week into it. And I just, I just beat everybody in that. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, you just beat um, Ryan Reeves. Like I beat Ms. Annan and then I beat Reeves. And so it was interesting because I'm like half the size. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I think I laughed at him. I think that's what it was. And I was just like, Bring! down. So it's just because I've been trained a little bit on how to arm wrestle. And he never had any technique. And that guy went on to be Ryback. Uh, he seems to have a bit of a chip on his shoulder now. How was he to deal with, like, on a personal level in those days? Um, unique. <laughs> he, I mean, he's, he was always nice to me. I mean, yeah. he's always he's always been nice. He's always been he's always been uh, you know um, you know in front of the cameras. Obviously, he turns on. He's a, he's a, I think he's I think he was focused on the wrong thing. He was focused on you know just building his muscles. He wasn't focused on really um, understanding all the other aspects that go into the business. And I was focused on personally not only understanding how to wrestle because you know they. They build like what else? No said. You know they 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 guarantee a million dollars, you know contract or they they have a million dollar competition. It's a big thing. Like all the other tough enoughs, they try to stick the guys out there they've never wrestled before. I did the exact opposite before this. Most people to get to that level, they're spending five ten years minimum um, yeah. to get on TV and really you know performing at that level. Um, and I mean, the best are doing 20, 30 years, you know, so I just know that it took time. Um, I knew it was going to take time. Um, and I had really good coaches working with me. And obviously, um, you know, to put a million dollar brand on somebody and trying to move them up right away, it's very challenging. How do you think uh, Ryback would have done if he had gone into Bellator? Because I understand at one point after he was released by WWE, there was some chats with him possibly having a Bellator fight. Um, he probably would have lasted two minutes. So if he'd whoop the guy in two minutes, then he would have won. Um, it, it's not the same, you know, obviously they do drug testing. Obviously, um, cardio is a key in MMA. Uh, I don't think he ever did cardio. Um, so, so I think there's things that are the opposite of what you need in WWE. WWE, you need cardio, but it's a totally different framework and intensity than a WWE, than an MMA fight. Now, how did the wrestlers treat you backstage overall that were already with WWE when you were doing those tough enough uh, segments? In the beginning, it was pretty, 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 um, pretty, uh, it, 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 to me, they never really mess with me backstage in in up up at WWE, um, but they, you know, I, I heard a lot of stuff. But who knows what's real and what's not? Obviously, one thing that I did that I think made a lot of them think where my heart was at, which I, I don't think they really like. I wouldn't conform, and I think that's one big challenge. I don't drink, I don't do drugs. Like I'm not going to conform to somebody else's beliefs when they have to do some substance to be able to make themselves feel a certain way. Um, and so I started building the ring every day. And even after I went tough enough, I was building the ring. So, and then I got told at one point, what are you doing, kid? You, you, you're the tough enough champ. So it's just, it's very interesting on where, what they could have done with me and what they could have built with me. It's like anybody. I mean, I have a company now and I get to build my own company. I get to see and find people and build them. Um, and it's awesome because I know how to find good talent. Who's going to be loyal long-term. Um, 
if there's another brand that that out there and, and there are a couple brands that are doing really well um people are moving over because there's not drama and there, there's no loyalty to people that don't give loyalty in the beginning and i think vince has really jacked that up with with only being loyal to a certain amount of people um but at the end of the day he doesn't from from what i see obviously i don't see everything but from what I see and I hear from a lot of different wrestlers, he doesn't really care about them. It's like the average sports franchise owner. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, you know, I mean, I've gotten multiple letters like, Hey, if you're addicted to this drug or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll help with rehab, whatever. Like at the end of the day, nobody's ever called me and said, Hey, what's up? Just want to check up how you're doing. Have a psychologist call, have a therapist, have a counselor, whatever, you know, I'd love to support you. Is there anything I can do long-term? Like nobody's ever done that. So I look at that. It's like, how do you really support your athletes after they leave you to be able to go around and say you support them, make sure their mental health, physical health, spiritual health is really connected. And I've never seen him do that. Um, you know, it's just, it's just talent to him. And you mentioned you don't drink. I had an interesting comment. I guess there was a wrestler that was being used as an extra one day during the, the tough enough segments and he said he doesn't know if you're going to remember this, but he said he witnessed this. I guess there was a day where Bill like did a toast backstage. It wasn't recorded or anything, and you wouldn't take a drink. And he said he witnessed Bill harassing you and like really giving you hell because you wouldn't take a drink backstage this day. Do you remember that at all? So I don't. I don't believe. I didn't. I don't remember it backstage. It could have been at like a at like an event after. Um, cause I don't think there was alcohol in the stadium ever that I saw personally, but it could have been after, um, there were two or three times that that happened to me with, with Bill and twice with Bill and, and once or twice with, uh, you know, a couple other people. Um, so it's very interesting to be able to see. And I, I told Bill at one point, I go, Bill, if you're going to threaten to kick my ass over, not drinking with you, then you can start right now. But I'm not going to change who I am for you. And so it's interesting to see what he's gone through with his daughter um, and where he's at today. Um, and I find that, you know, um, people like that that have anger and hurt in their life will only change when a loved one or an experience is so detrimental to their life that they have to, that they lose something um so it's it's interesting you know karma karma's karma's out there yeah because a lot of people i've no, i've talked to a bunch of people that were trained with him and some people have the perception that people complained just because he made people do 500 squats or whatever or take a, a large amount of bumps but there was actually some personal bullying that went on with his training as well i guess from what i understand so I think there's a difference between like the training side of it being tough. And I'm fine with that. Um, there was one experience I had with him where he would different people would do back bumps when we're training, we do different, different wrestling moves. And some of the guys, like he would yell at them because they do it wrong. They would stay on the ground and just like look up at him. I would never do that. I get up. I'm saying, can you show me what to do? Right. You know, and, and I would, I'm a very good listener because in my sport in MMA, if you don't do it right, you get punched in the kicked in the face and you get broke or hurt or dead, right? So he did it to me one day. I got up. He said, come here. He grabbed my little finger and bent it backwards. And it was like this. I'm like, awesome. So you have it. And I look at him and he bent it backwards where it hurt. And I looked at his face. I said, if you're going to break it, break it. But at the end of the day, if you want to get me to do something right, just coach me and teach me how to do it right. Because I'm here to listen and learn. And he let it go and he never fucked with me after that. But to me, it's unprofessional, unacceptable. If I ever saw that in my organization, I would automatically fire somebody because people who treat people like that are so hurt and beat up inside that they only can hurt other people. And so it's just an interesting perspective on where I'm at today versus where I was then because I didn't understand a lot. I didn't understand as much about myself, but WWE had me, helped me a lot grow and understand experiences that maybe I wouldn't have wanted to go through, but I went through because 
it was meant for me to um, learn, grow, and, and impact the world. Now, of course, the big thing that WWE blew with uh, your whole situation was you had a feud with Kurt Angle. It's been, I don't know what, 15 years now. People still talk about it. Um, that could have actually developed into a pro wrestling feud. But could you tell us about that day and what exactly happened with that uh, situation where I guess you put a Kimura on Kurt Angle? Yeah, and Kurt's still pissed off. I tried to take him out to lunch. Really? Poor guy. I was going to talk smack the whole time. He said, no way. I even told him I'd buy lunch. So at the end of the day, you know, I'd take him to the strip club next to where he met his wife. Oh, oh smack. Say like, that out loud. You know, he's all a man. Well, you know, he is released now. I don't know if you know this. He just got released. So you might be able to finally get that match on, a, on the independent scene. You know what? Here's the thing. Kurt hears about this. He knows my number. If he doesn't, um, you know, there's multiple people he can reach out to get it. And I would love to have that with him. Um, I think something like that could be a huge, I mean, let's just get President Trump involved with that one too. I mean, let's have a little bit of fun with this, you know, I mean, we'll get some big media on this. We'll do it for Corona. There you go. So, um, so so that day was crazy. Uh, sprints, um, eating food, eating pasta, drinking milk, more for liners, um, you know, and then and then out to the ring and up down competition. The, the difference was in me and how I trained is I trained smart. Everybody else just trained hard. I trained smart and hard, and everybody else trained hard. I trained for the longevity. So I was not only doing two, three, four hours of promos a day. I was doing my the right cardio, the right eating, even though we were living in a hotel. Um, uh, I, I wasn't partying, drinking, you know, and going out late. I was getting my sleep. Uh, I was stretching, right? So I was really doing everything properly. Um, definitely because I learned a lot of that from Frank Shamrock and Javier Mendez of how to train properly as an athlete. Um, but I trained for an endurance athlete too, like MMA is 15, 20, 25 minutes, you know, we're, we're training. So um, going into the ring with Kurt that day, I, one of my coaches, Danny Shade, uh, was a runner up to him in the Olympics. I think he lost by a couple points. Um, and um, so I knew that Kurt couldn't be that much better than him uh, because those guys are all at the top, you know, you win by a couple points on, on a day. It's either, you know, all the guys are that good. It just depends on if you get the move and if you can pull it off. So Danny used to whoop me, but I knew that if I, you know, if I was out there doing MMA, I would do really well because he's not an MMA. There's a whole, it's a different sport. You know I mean? It's, it's like, it's like motorcycle riding versus car, car. It's like motorcycle uh, racing versus car driving. It might be the same concept of an engine and tires and everything else, but it's a whole different framework. Um, so I went in there and, and, you know, I saw his arm and I said, you know, I'll pull this little sucker see how far I can pull it off. And, um, you know, I wasn't even on my back. You know, you can, you can look at the referee, what they said. Um, you know, they, they said in the back, uh, you know, they told the refs to, to three count it. And, you know, they, they, it's crazy how they can cheat in a real event in a, in a scripted entertainment industry. <laughs> so it is what it is. Uh, great experience in my life. Um, that's what I think, you know, gave me the, one of the upper hands to showing people what I was made out of because nobody else wanted a piece of the, one of the toughest guys in the world. And I, I, I'm okay with getting whooped. Like if you don't get whooped, you don't grow. There's no growth in ease. So I like to be able to create some, um, uh, a little dis-ease in my life a little once in a while and get pushed. What was the reaction in the back when you got to the back? Did the trainers tell you anything or the agents? I, right off the bat, from what I remember, they didn't. They were like, like <laughs> they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what happened. I think till Tuesday, till it, or Thursday, till it aired. I think that's really when they realized what happened, and then it was like, oh crap, because um, yeah, I, I don't think they really understood the whole entire thing from what I heard and what I saw. And then it blew up. And then, 
you know, I, next week I'm getting, I'm getting signs in the stands and, you know, people are cheering for me. And so it's a whole, it's a whole different thing. And I heard you say Kurt pretty much didn't talk to you again, other than congratulating you after you won. Correct. I don't so, even think I saw him again backstage. I think he was scared of me the whole time that I would take his other arm and do it. I see. And of course, uh, you and Miz were the finalists, but you also did the skit where you had to dress like a, a woman with him and stuff. What was your experiences like with Miz overall? Miz is great. He's super smart. Apologize for that. Oh, it's okay. I think Miz, it's is, back. Miz is super smart. Um, he doesn't like to lose. Uh, he had probably, I was getting like, I think like 30,000 unique hits a day on my website. At that time, he was getting like 75, something like a thousand hits. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to win if it comes down to fan votes. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and, um, you know, he's, he's smart. I mean, he took a deal later to be able to build into the, into it. He's a company, he's a company guy, which is great. Um, I would have, I would have loved to build something, uh, and, and been able to, you know, been able to give the, the car blanche to go out there and be myself. Um, and I was great, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a badass and, and I'm undefeated. So why not push somebody? They've tried the MMA gimmick. You know, um, in w in WWE and pro wrestling, you know, and not that many people can pull it off with personality because most MMA fighters don't have a personality. <laughs> so yeah, so. Kane Velasquez just got released after only really having a couple of matches with them. It's it's not easy, you know. I mean, I like I was talking to Hop about that, and um, you know, I, I think that. You know, to, to go from MMA to WWE, it's exact opposite. One of them, you're going into their smash somebody. The other one is, is you got to look like you're smashing, but you, you got to you gotta play. Now, I also saw the, uh, the boxing match you had with Miz. I tried to look up the full thing, but WWE has only posted one round, and you guys were fairly even on that round. Uh, I don't know how the other two rounds went. Are you surprised he was able to last the three rounds? I, I understand he did have some boxing experience. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he did some training in the past, just like I did. Um, you know, uh, I think it was great that he could last three one, you know, three one minute rounds. Um, if they were two minute, there's no way he would have lasted. I would have smashed him by by the end of the first or you know, mid of the second. So it's just, you know, I mean it's it's a obviously it's a gimmick on on how they can make something last really short um and and make both sides just go out there with a bunch of energy um but yeah he he knew that he had nothing to lose and he couldn't uh do that and um i i was really impressed with him that day i mean miz is a miz is really tough he's smart he's tough he pushes through um he's got great characteristics is it true that either Pat Patterson or some other agent told you you were going to win before you actually won Tough Enough? wasn't It wasn't Pat Patterson. It was a guy back at headquarters that was that was um, involved with seeing the data on how many votes were coming in. Okay. Um, so at the end of the day, it was, and he told me that from like week three when I went back early because everybody else went home and he, he smoked a cigarette out, out back. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate you. Like, he was like, you're going to win. Like, I thought it was like a cheerleading thing. Right. And then I got there at the, at the end and he's, he's like, I told you you're going to win. I saw him again. He's the only two times I've ever seen this guy. I don't even remember what he looks like. I don't know his name, but he's an amazing guy. And he goes, I told you you'd win. And I go, how'd you know? He goes, I'm the one in charge of the votes. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I didn't ask the right questions the first time. Now, Bruce Pritchard did a podcast about you. I don't know if you ever heard it, but he was one of the producers back there at the time you were going through that tough enough. And I guess he had some say 
in the creative of those tough enough uh, s- segments. Did you ever have much contact with Bruce back in those days? I think I might have had a little bit of contact, but not much. We were around uh, Al Snow and, uh, you know, some of the core, w- you know, some of the tough enough team, but we, we didn't, un- unless it was like random bumping in, we stayed as a, as a, as a group a lot. Is it true at one point Dana White contacted you about trying to do the angle match with you and angle and MMA? Um, there was talks of it. Uh, I don't believe Dana called me on it. Dana, I think, talked to him on it. He might have talked to one of my managers about it. Um we talked a couple times, but I don't remember everything we said, so we could have brought it up at that point. Um, uh, but I don't remember. At that point in time, it's unlikely Kurt probably could have been licensed, I guess, as well, with all his injuries and whatever he had in his body, I guess, to keep going in wrestling. Yeah, I don't think with, you know, I mean, you can't be on pain pills and you can't be on anything else when you're fighting in the UFC. So um, they're pretty strict about it. I mean, I've done multiple WADA testing, World Anti-Doping Agency drug tests, and I've passed every single one of them. Um, they take an A and a B sample. And what I've heard is they keep one of those samples. They keep one of the samples for the next round and you go in to take the next test, they compare it with the same DNA. So I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what I've heard. And it's pretty serious. Um, um, you know, if, if you're doing drugs. Now, did you ever have any interactions with Bradshaw backstage? He was known for bullying the weaker wrestlers, but you strike me as someone he might not, not wanted uh, to have messed with. Yeah, yeah, we I mean we talked. He he was he was always very cordial to me. Um he was he's a very smart guy. Um he was always very polite and nice. Now you had uh, an unusual situation, I guess, at Royal Rumble two thousand and five. Um sorry, your screen just got messed up for a second. Sorry but at that. Royal Rumble two thousand and five, there was a situation in the ring with Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and, and Hardcore Holly chopping you. All the fans like to say they beat you up, but I, I bet you that was probably, you knew that was going to happen, right? Because Royal Rumble is choreographed. Or was it a surprise to you? Um, I had no clue what they were going to do. Um, they treated me like crap. And uh, very disrespectful. Now, none of those guys, well, I guess Eddie Guerrero was known to have a temper. Chris Benoit, never really known as a fighter. Hardcore Holly didn't do too well in the brawl for all. How do you think you would have done against those guys if it had been one-on-one and they and they tried to mess around with you? So I could have taken all three of them if, if, I, if I wanted to go smash them all. Um, hardcore Holly, is he tough? Yeah, but he's, he's, uh, he, he helped coach me back in the day. I asked him for help and support. And then he went and talked smack in his book to get better ratings and sell more books. So he's a profiteer. He doesn't care about people at this point from my perspective. And, um, he's insignificant and rude. I don't think about him. Uh, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. Um, I thought they were nice guys. Um, I liked Eddie, but, uh, you know, after that happened, I thought that I thought both of them, you know, it is what it is. Like, again, you know, look at, look at who treats people good in this world and look at who treats people like crap and see what happens to their lives. And and they create their own, their, their own outcomes. So I guess the reason you kind of just went along with it is you were the newbie in the company. They're the veterans. You're just following their lead in the match. Yeah. Did they say anything to you backstage? I guess just regular stuff when you got back there. No. I see. 
Now, Bruce said in this podcast that he did about you that uh, his reasoning for offering you the smaller contract after a year was because you had difficulty coming up with uh, creative ideas for yourself. Um, Is that just him making excuses or did you find you had issues creatively? So when you say creatively, can you tell me about that? I guess as far as ideas for your character and how you were going to get yourself over in the company. He said they tried to have writers work with you on on coming up with stuff and there was issues related with that. He is known to be a liar, though, but I just was wondering what your response was uh, to him saying that. So that's... I like that he's known to be a liar. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know his perspective. Number one, um, from my perspective, I was an MMA, you know, fighter. I was tough. Uh, you know, I mean, I was jacked. I was shredded. I was blonde. I was young. Um, you know, uh, could I speak? Eh, it was. It was getting better, right? Like it's a different world than than what I was used to. Could I wrestle? Eh, it was getting better. I mean, it was, it was what I was doing for, you know, six, three, six months, right? Before. So I think um, creatively, I don't think there was ever an issue. Um, I think, uh, you know, I had a good brand in WWE. And I don't know why they would ever veer off of that brand. Um, so that doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. I got over more than he's ever gotten over by winning a, a competition by fan votes. Um, so uh, this, uh, from what I heard, our time slots on on TV were four times on average what the regular SmackDown show was on the watching time. So we got more eyeballs than what the normal. So if I wasn't getting over, then I wouldn't have won. Um, you know, a big competition on their actual SmackDown because this wasn't on MTV like the past ones. So I think I did pretty good getting over. Um, so, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. And I, I would say creatively, they should have at least had a match with you in Angle. That's that's a waste of their own creative. Because even if they, they had put Angle over, people still would have tuned in for that match, whether it was on pay-per-view or like a television taping. But. So the one of the promos they had me cut, uh, and I could send it to you, it was with a couple of girls. Like, I was talking smack to the girls. And I'm thinking to myself, why do you want to position me as an asshole? Like, I just want to show a fan favorite. And now you want to turn me to piss off the people that just voted for me. Utilize the fan votes. Utilize the people that just watched every single week. It makes no sense to make a switch on them at this point. Um, make a switch in a couple of years, you know, that I got too big for my britches in two years, you know, so the things that their writers have done, um, if they say that they were trying to come up with ideas, obviously they didn't do well enough job with, with training me or, or doing what they wanted to. So I, I, I would have loved to be able to, uh, met the writer that says that. And when you were in developmental, did you notice, obviously I've been a wrestler, I noticed how the jealousy in backstage is, you were making more than the other developmental guys, did you notice if you had any heat about that or did they all treat you pretty equally? Uh, down in developmental, um, a lot of them were uh, unique humans on how they treated me for sure. Um, you know, they were just jealous. They they. You know, they they worked their butt off to get there and um, they didn't take the same opportunities I did. They didn't maybe have the same opportunities I did. And, um, you know, I mean, hey, everybody's, you know, I mean, I get it now in the space that I'm at. You know, people are jealous. It is what it is. Like, you know, I mean, what I'm up to and how I'm changing lives in the education space. We're taking kids that are coming out of jail and foster care and you know, challenging situations and transforming their lives because we transform their minds and their hearts. Um, But I think that, you know, people that, uh, you know, if it's a job, it's a job. That's one thing. For me, this was a passion. So there's a difference between um, I didn't care about the money. Was the money great? Yeah. Nobody knows that I tried out for Tough Enough 3. 
It was on MTV. Really? <laughs> you're the first. You're the first one I've ever said it to. Um, I can show you trial video, and I did. A, I, but I had things in my life at that point where I couldn't commit to it. And so they wanted me as the top, as the top one. So I would have been in a different tough nut. Um, so it's just, you know, I, I wasn't going, it wasn't about the money to me. It was about the, the, the experience that I could perform and that I could do something that I love to do. What city did you try out in for tough enough three? Denver, Colorado. Interesting. Interesting. That's pretty cool. That was the one that I guess John Morrison won. Yep. So he, I would have won it. He wouldn't have been there. <laughs> John's now, a great guy. Jim Cornette uh, was in Ohio Valley wrestling. Did you have much experience with him? Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, he. I don't think he liked me too much. I don't. I don't. I don't think he knew what to do with something that was real. Um. You know. And what about Paul Heyman? I think he was working there at the time. Paul Heyman, uh, I, I liked Paul Heyman a lot. Paul's a unique guy and very intelligent, very smart, very unique. Um, and he took a, took a liking to me and he spent a lot of time with me. So you know, if, if people were saying, oh, yeah, uh, you know, he, like I had Paul working with me on on creative. So, so <clears throat> if they said that I couldn't, grow and i had the best hey that's interesting so i guess uh i guess you were in ovw when they made you the offer of the new contract and you decided to just leave um did you want to pursue wrestling after that or did you decide okay i'm going to go down the mma path yep i said i'm gonna go down the mma path and i'm going to uh just you know it, it, it was something I knew and uh, I loved. And uh, what I didn't want to do is, is I didn't want to be around people that didn't care about me as a human. And I had some people in the MMA world that did care about me. And I understand you had a couple matches here and there with New Japan and TNA over the years. Yep. Good experience. Oh, okay. Great experience. Yeah, yeah I, I loved working in Japan fought in Japan for my first pro fight too. Um, you know, all those, all those other companies I worked with, they're, they're amazing companies. Did you ever consider applying for the ultimate fighter? Yeah. Right after I won tough enough, I got offered that by Dana White. Um, so uh, I turned down, it was like $500 a week. So I was like, hold on guys. Um, I'm getting 5,000 a week right now at this point, And I love what I'm doing. Um, and, and you guys are offering me 500 a week and you know, it's, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me. I'm like, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. After the contract, we can talk. Is it true at one point you had a sparring session with Tito Ortiz? No, I've never sparred with Tito. Tank Abbott said on a recent podcast point, there was some talk of you having a fight with Tank Abbott. Do you have any recollection of that? I do. Um, he actually talks smack, more smack than just that. So, um, oh, yeah, I didn't hear it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got you got to watch the smack talking one that he talks about. Um, yeah, I, I think Tank Tank's a, a brawler. Um, he's not in the same league, obviously. He's he's he, even in his heyday, he was just a brawler. He wasn't a real fighter, like well-rounded fighter. Um, but he built a good brand because he's a brawler, and he went out there and won a lot of fights. Uh, I don't know how many won, how many lost, but um, I did want to fight him. We were working on it, um, and uh, it didn't happen. It seems A to know. It's a pretty good record. You were fighting for Strike Force, and as you said, in Japan for some big companies. Is there any reason uh, Bellator, that was run by the same guy that ran Strike Force or, or UFC, never like give you, gave you a bigger fight to really get you on the map more as an MMA guy? So, um, strike four, Scott Coker held me in a contract and screwed me. Um, so I would never work for him again. And, uh, at that point, my management wouldn't defend me. 
So when I was 26 years old, I was uh, six and zero, uh, pro, uh, number 26 in the world uh, for heavyweights, and I got jacked on a contract for 18 months. So it was an exclusive contract. I couldn't do anything else. Um, so after that, uh, I moved to LA, and my heart was not in it as much. Um, the people that I thought that were in my life to protect me, they didn't protect me. And um, I had a couple other fights after that. And I was like, you know what, this, I'm not in anymore. Like, I love training AK, I love training um, by my management and uh, Bob Cook and, and the Zinkins, they didn't, they didn't take care of me. Have you seen any of Jake Hager's fights? No. What did you think of Brock Lesnar as an MMA fighter? Um, I thought that he, obviously, he's, he's tough. But he's, you know, he's, he's not, he's not an MMA fighter, you know, really he's a wrestler. So there's, there's a big difference between, you know, like, um, you know, like, like, like an actual MMA fighter versus more of a wrestler that gets into it. That's at that level. Great brand. Um, he's tough. He's done very well. I'm very proud of him. Now you mentioned you'd still consider a match with, with Kurt Angle, uh, would you say your career as a pro wrestler is over or if you had the right offer, would you make another run at wrestling? You're, you're not over the hill yet by any stretch. If it was the right deal, I would consider it. Um, I just got another offer to somebody wants to represent me for something. And, and I'm really focused on the business side of it now. Um, I'm doing a lot in education and with politics and, you know, in, in different sectors. So I love doing that. So to me, it's, if it was the right thing and they wanted to really take care of me uh, as an athlete, I'd be down. Is there anything you do differently with WWE looking back on it now, all these years later? Yeah, I would have, uh, I would have, um, uh, you know, looked at how to train with the right people. Uh, they could have maybe opened the right doors a little bit better. Um, you know, and, and, and built some better relationships in there. Um, but you know, I, I, I didn't understand how to do that, that young of an age, um, which today taught me how to build those relationships and, and really, um, you know, open the right doors. Do you still follow wrestling at all? Or is, is that part of your life done as far as being a fan? A little bit, but not much. My, my, my schedule, I work, I do about 80 hours a week. <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, I, I don't have as much time to follow much anymore. And you've been on TMZ several times. Uh, they've always put you over. They've they don't go after you. They they uh, like all the work you do with the bullying. How did you get a relationship with TMZ? Um, I think they just really like the context of how I live life and what I'm about. Uh, so you know, me standing up for kids that are you know LGBT or special ed or whatever group. Um, you know, I, I wish I had somebody in my life to do that for me when I was a kid and, and I was like learning disabled in special ed classes. So, you know, that's, that's one reason why I built our schools and, you know, it really adds a lot of value to, um, you know, some people just go out there and talk about what they are about. Some people actually do. Um, and so my, my purpose is to really do and really solve some major problems in my lifetime. What's the accomplishment you're most proud of so far in your life? I would say building our three schools that we have now, uh, building our team. And um, I have some, I have, I have a bunch of accomplishments. So I'd say building the schools and, and I was able to do that because I built a really good team. And uh, I have some really good friends that I've built with uh, my best friend, Brittany and Ed that have really stuck for the last 10 years, making like nothing uh, just so we could build what we're doing, but, you know, impacting these lives. And if people watching this want to follow you or, or look up your website, where can they find you online? Yeah, they can Google My Life, My Power or My Life, My Power Preparatory Academy. They can go to my website, Daniel Pewter. I got our podcast, Significance Breed Success. Um, so love to have people check us out. My social media, Daniel Pewter, My Life, My Power is every, on everything. So, uh, yeah, if people want to come out and support, speak at our schools. If wrestlers want to come out and you know, speak, love to have them. And we just put Dan... Uh, uh, Dan Rodeimer's name on a school, um, our color Bay school, and he's out in Vegas. And 
he's uh, over the years, he's become a really good friend of mine. So I'm, I'm really proud of him running for Congress and, you know, doing some amazing things too. I actually had a match with him back in 2006. He is a, he's a nice guy. Um, is there any other of those tough enough guys that you still keep in contact with? No, just him. What is he doing nowadays? He's running for U.S. Congress in Vegas. Oh, really? So that's he's he's really a politician full time. Yep, yep. If you shoot me a text, I'll text you his number, and yeah, you'd probably love to be on your show. Oh yeah, I'd love to have him. And I I saw one of your interviews. You wanted to run for governor. Do you still have that goal? <sighs> you know, I might have said something like that. No, I mean, it's could I run for governor? You know. It, it, you know, who, who knows? I'm, I'm concentrating right now on the school side of it. Um, if I get the right opportunity in the future, but this is the biggest thing. It's either mayor, governor, or president. Um, there's only a certain amount of people, sheriff. There's only a certain amount of people that actually have real power to get things done. Um, you know, and, and people have asked me to run for, maybe I said somebody asked me to run for, I don't remember that interview, but I know pe multiple people have asked me to run for state rep, state senator. I got an offer last year for mayor. Um, somebody was like, Hey, you want to run for mayor? We'll back you. Um, so I've, I've had a bunch of different offers, but to me, it's, it's, I really want to prove myself in the public sector or in the private sector before I move into public sector. If I ever do that. Uh, this is kind of an off the wall question, but, uh, we also have done some UFO interviews on this channel, the Pentagon last week, um, released some, some videos officially that I guess the the U.S. Navy took of some unidentified flying objects, and they're saying that they they don't know what they are, but they're in our airspace. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? No, no thoughts, except for we probably have some people that don't look like us that fly around in very fast things that we can't see or hear or understand. I, I'm best. I'm guessing we have some of those for sure. For sure. And we have a lot of MMA uh, fighters that watch this because I do MMA interviews. Any advice for uh, fighters out there that might be watching this as an undefeated fighter? Yeah, keep your chin down. Uh, get good management. Get a great lawyer. Uh, get a good publicist. Get an agent. Uh, get into movies as fast as you can or a business. And don't drink uh, or do drugs to spend your money away. Save it in something that you do, not something your best friend comes to you and tells you, hey, let's open a restaurant. And any other message you want to say uh, before we close it off here to the fans that have watched this? Hey, just, you know, my, my challenge for everybody always is to, you know, think about your significance and your success in life. And I believe that significance breeds success. At the end of the day, you can be successful in life and be great at what you, what you put your mind to. But if nobody cares about you, if you don't care about yourself, then or you don't care about other people and impact in the world, um, then what do you do it all for? So, you know, self, 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 go internally into yourself and figure that out to be the best version of yourself. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, catch up with us. Uh, to close this off, any final message for Kurt Angle? If he's watching this by some chance. Kurt, you're one of the toughest humans in the world. I get it. You married, you're the all-American. You married the girl next door. You have a kid. You know, too bad you live next to a strip club. But it is what it is. And if you ever want to wrestle, let's see how good you are. Let's see how tough. Let's do a drug test. Let's see how tough you are without anything else. So I'll whoop your ass. Good. I'll, I'll stop it at that. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Hey, shoot, no me problem. shoot me a text real quick. I'll hook you up with Dan. My my text my my cells on my email, and I'll okay. hook you up with Dan over over text message. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon, and I'll I'll text you in the next five minutes. I appreciate you so much, bro. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. I'll tweet uh, I'll tweet this out to you when it's finished. Thanks, bro. I'll push it out too. Awesome. Thanks. Later, brother. Later.